have one of the wealthiest countries in the Gulf um, normalize relations with Israel. It's going to be signed uh, next Tuesday, by the way. That news came out today in Washington. Um, um, am I exaggerating, um, General Cooper, when I say this is a sea change moment for the Middle East? What does it mean from a macro point of view? What does it mean for the Palestinians? What does it mean on the Iranian file? Well, first of all, thank you everybody for uh, participating and hosting me. And uh, especially Dan, I should always take you with me wherever I go to, to hear all these flattering. Come on. <laughs> Get your credit card ready. It's going to cost you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, but, uh, let's go to the point. Uh, yes. Uh, it is a, a game changer. Out of it. Somebody has to control their to be muted. Uh, it is a game changer, uh, changer in the in the relations between Israel and the and the Middle East and the Arab world and the Muslim world. It is a, uh, also a very important uh, turning point when it comes to Israel's relations with the Palestinians. And uh, I believe that this is going to have an impact on uh, on the way. The Middle East is going to look like in, in the future as well, and uh, we still, we, it's still in the making, but uh, there's no, no doubt that it's going to be successful, because the first uh, attribute of this agreement, unlike any other peace agreement we had with Egypt or with Jordan or the agreement, the Oslo agreement we had with the Palestinians, is that this is supposed to be a warm peace. It's not the, the, uh, the kind of peace uh, agreements we had before that were always based on the idea that they wanted something tangible from us, so they were ready to fight to us uh, for a short period of time. But they always uh, expected us to do much more, and they never, it was not coming from the people, it was coming from the leadership, and it stayed with the leadership, and they never, uh, uh, was never shared by the public. Uh, here, is for the first time have something different is happening. People on both sides are eager to, to see it uh, turning into a reality. Every, every Israeli today has to know at least uh, one uh, person from the UAE and uh, they probably are now contemplating how to make to do business together and how to become friends. And uh, the people in the, in, the, in the UAE are not uh, shy about the contrary, they are all happy to see that uh, they are making peace with Israel and uh, there's almost no opposition inside the inside UAE, some very small group, uh, but the population is in favor of it and it's not only the UAE. If we listen to the, to the messages coming from the entire uh, pragmatic world, pragmatic elements in the, uh, in the Arab world, all of them are saying things that we were waiting for ages to, to hear. And they are now saying it out loudly and proudly. And uh, they say, well, what's, what's the problem? Why, why haven't we recognized Israel long ago? Why did we waste so much time? Why did we waste our money and effort on uh, something that's not, not, never going to happen, like that Israel will be er erased from the, from the map? This is, this is nonsense. This is not in our interest. And uh, more than that, we should realize that the Jews as a people, have a, a title for the land that where they where they live, and uh, that uh, this right is is based on a historical connection between the Jews and the and the land of Israel, and uh, we are doing the right thing, and it's the, the good thing for us, and it's a good thing also for the Palestinians, and uh, that's the, the the logic they are adopting now, and uh, and that's why I think people in Israel in general are happy about this peace because this means that the, the dream of being integrated into, into, the, into the region, the dream that people around us will understand that we are a force for the good, and it's a good idea to, to be our friends because we bring with, our, with us uh, progress, we bring with us modernity, we bring us with us tikkun olam, we bring with us all kinds of things that, uh, that are in our nature. That, that is happening. When, when Herzl wrote uh, Alt Neuland back uh, more than 100 years ago, uh, his idea was that the Arabs living in Israel and the Arabs living around Israel will be blessed by the uh, nature of the Jewish people that will help all of them be, have a better life. 
And uh, here, for the first time, somebody realizes that, well, maybe this guy had something in what he was uh, dreaming about. And that's uh, something very important for us because in integrating into the Middle East was something we always spoke about and we thought it beyond our reach for the foreseeable future. And now it's, this dream becomes a reality. So this is the first thing I think that uh, is interesting. The second thing that's very interesting and why it is a game changer is that we actually uh, break uh, a glass ceiling that many people believed was there. I was not among them. I thought this could have, been, could have happened for quite a while. But, uh, but many people thought that we should never be able to get integrated into the Middle East unless we succumb to all the demands of the Palestinians. If we don't go back to the 67 lines and allow the Palestinians have a Palestinian state with Jerusalem as its capital and uh, without them recognizing Israel as the national state of the Jewish people, unless we do all of that, we shall never be integrated. We shall never be able to, to have normal relations with, the, with anybody in the Arab world. Now, this is nonsense and uh, has been nonsense for a while, but, uh, but it was proven true because it didn't happen. And, uh, and now, uh, this glass ceiling is, is broken. We can have normal relations with, uh, with our neighbors without succumbing to the Palestinian dictate. And we have to understand this Palestinian dictate was uh, uh, written in uh, what you, everybody knows as the Arab Peace Initiative. This was the Palestinian dictate to Israel. Uh, if you want to have normal relations with, uh, with the Arabs, then you have to uh, uh, accept all their demands uh, go out from uh, the territories we took in 67, allow the Palestinians to have uh, Jerusalem as, as, as their capital, have a Palestinian state, and do not expect anybody, not the Arabs, nor the uh, Palestinians, except Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people, which is what it is. This is the purpose for its existence. Unless you don't accept, or as long as you don't accept it, you actually mean you want to have a continued, a continued and the perpetrating uh, conflict with Israel. So here is the, is the major change in, in breaking this uh, glass ceiling. Thirdly, it is a game changer between, uh, because the major issue in the Middle East is the confrontation between the radicals on the one hand, that are, we have all kinds of uh, groups within the radical uh, camp, and uh, the pragmatists on the, other, on the other side. Now, Israel is, of course, on the side of the pragmatists, and Unlike any other country in the world, it is the only country that the pragmatists know that it will always be on their side. Today, the United States is also on the side of the pragmatists, but go back four years, it wasn't. The Europeans, nobody knows on whose side they are, probably on the side of the radicals. Uh, Russians, same. The Chinese, depends who pays them more. So it's, uh, it's, it's clear that the only country in the, in the world that you can always rely upon if you are a pragmatic Arab living in the Middle East is Israel. And now with this glass ceiling broken and the Israel getting integrated into the Middle East, the pragmatic camp got uh, an injection of power that is uh, very meaningful. And this is why all the radicals are so concerned with this move. I'm talking about Iran, which leads its own radical uh, group uh, consisting of uh, Hezbollah and Syria and uh, some elements in Iraq and Hamas and uh, especially the Palestinian Islamic Jihad and many others, the Houthis and, and others, all of them are very worried because yes, Israel was having some kind of relations with, uh, with the pragmatic camp for a long time. But now that it is on the open, we can do a lot more to support the pragmatic camp. And you have to understand, uh, that the pragmatic camp is in a, in a real war, in, a, in, a, in the battlefield, fighting the, the radical camp. So I mentioned Iran, of course, on the, uh, one example. The other very uh, important example is Turkey, who is all over the Middle East uh, fighting the, on behalf of the, another kind of radicals, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, fighting on behalf of the Muslim Brotherhood against the pragmatists in Libya and the uh, and uh, having uh, influence in Syria and Iraq and uh, in Somalia, they have a base in Somalia, they have a base in Qatar, that also belong to the same group like, uh, Tur like Turkey. And, Tur and Qatar, of course, is very close to, uh, to the UAE uh, and to other pragmatic uh, uh, camp uh, members. 
So this is a battle that's being waged all over the Middle East. And now with Israel in the pragmatic camp, everybody feels much safer and much uh, stronger in, in this camp. And, uh, and you have to remember, not only that Israel is the only one that will always be on their side, it's also that uh, uh, Israel is the only one that is not afraid and uh, is not shy of facing and taking action against the radicals if necessary. We do that every, every week when we uh, attack all kinds of uh, positions of the Iranians in, in Syria. And, uh, and we, when we have to confront uh, the radicals in Gaza, we do that. And we fight uh, the terrorism of the radicals on a permanent basis. So it's, it's, uh, it's a very important addition uh, and, uh, to, the, to the pragmatic camp. And everybody is very impressed with that. And this is why all the radicals are so uh, unhappy and uh, concerned with this. And you saw the, the, the reaction of Turkey, for example. Of course, uh, Iran, they are very concerned. So these are the changes that occur in the region and they are very important and uh, as I said, game changer. And I believe that uh, if we manage to deliver, uh, to, to make the life of the people who cooperate with us better through this cooperation between us and them, through the normalization, if we can make them stronger when they face the radicals uh, through our capabilities to help them in intelligence, in, uh, in other security matters, then, uh, then more countries will join in from this uh, pragmatic camp and, uh, and uh, support it. You can also already see that the, the, all the members of the pragmatic camp are in this business. It's not only the UAE. The UAE leads, the UAE has been the leader of the pragmatic camp for a couple of years now. It's more courageous and more active than other members of the pragmatic camp like Saudi Arabia or uh, Egypt and uh, recently Sudan and uh, Oman and Bahrain and others, but it's, it's not alone there. The UAE is not alone. And uh, even if some of the others are not going to, to go all the way like the UAE did and uh, make a normaliza full normalization of relations with Israel, others can do all kinds of moves towards partial normalization that are also very important. If Sudan, for example, allows us to fly over its territory, uh, for Israel, this is extremely important. Uh, it is going to shorten the way from here to Latin America considerably and to other places in Egypt, in uh, Africa. Uh, it's uh, the same with Saudi Arabia. It's Saudis have already given us permission to fly over their territory. And this is shortening the time that we need in order to uh, cross to Abu Dhabi and maybe in the future also to all kinds of destinations in, uh, in, uh, in Asia. This is extremely important for, for Israel and this sh as a show of their understanding that this is the direction they have to follow. And uh, we, of course, hope that some of them will also establish full diplomatic relations with, with Israel, but uh, partial normalization is also highly appreciated. It's not uh, something that we can uh, uh, underestimate. So uh, this is on, on the regional level. Secondly, this is a game changer in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Because for the first time, it's clear that the idea that Israel will have to go back to 67 lines, the lines that uh, Abba Iban at the time uh, said that they remind him of Auschwitz, uh, the, uh, this option is off the table. Yes, the extension of sovereignty over some part of the uh, uh, Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley was also suspended. But the option of uh, going back to 67 lines and giving up uh, half of Jerusalem is really off the table. And uh, this is very good news for Israel's security because it's really difficult to, to uh, defend Israel from, from these lines. So it's, uh, until now, until this uh, new development, the two options that many people thought, including in Israel, that we have to consider are either status quo, continuing the status quo, or going back to 67 line. That's what, what we were offered all, all along the years. This was what uh, offered, was offered to us to, uh, through the our peace initiative. This was what offered to us by uh, the uh, Kerry-Obama uh, plan, uh, usually without any sufficient uh, security uh, uh, conditions, 
it's, uh, it was really a, a very difficult fight to, to convince people that this is dangerous for Israel. Let me remind you, in uh, the last thing Obama did was to allow, actually to, to promote a uh, resolution in the United Nations Security Council, resolution 2334, that actually spoke about the need for Israel to move into these lines, the six, seven lines. That's, uh, and uh, according to this uh, logic, the territories we took over in 67 are Occupied Palestinian Territory, OPT. That's also an acronym for them, OPT. It's, uh, and it didn't help much that we said, no, these are not. <laughs> uh, but there, was, there was never a Palestine. We never took anybody's uh, land over there. This land was supposed to be ours according to the mandate given to the British uh, uh, by the League of Nations and approved by the, by the UN. And, uh, and yes, the Palestinians have a claim on that. So these are disputed land. We have to work out something to how to, what, to, uh, what is going to be the fate of this land in the future. But the, the, the way it was presented to us by the international community was that these are Palestinian lands. What are you doing here? And, uh, and we had to, to fight very bitter fights against uh, people that uh, were in key positions. And you all remember the very strained relations between uh, Bibi and Obama. Uh, so, uh, here, yes, we didn't go the sovereignty extension way, but once an Arab state says that because you gave up or you suspended the extension of your sovereignty over these lands, over these disputed lands, we are ready to normalize relations with you, then the two options that are now on the table are either status quo or extension of sovereignty. This is uh, the two main, main options that are, that are on the table right now. And uh, yeah, we, we chose status quo because of all kinds of reasons. Not only because we wanted to have normalization with, with the UAE, we wanted to have normalization, but this was not the main reason. The main reason was that the American administration was not ready to support extension of sovereignty, even though it is a part of their plan. They said, but not now, we do not support it now. So we didn't have a real option of extending sovereignty. But what we got in exchange was another paradigm change in the context of the Palestinians. Now we have two other options to the two options that we used to have in the past. So uh, this change, of course, drives the Palestinians crazy because it puts them in a very weak position. They always, uh, their uh, bargaining uh, position was also always based on the fact that if Israel wants to be in, in integrated into the, and accepted by the Middle East and integrated into the region, they have to give us everything we want. Unless they do that, we shall, they will never have this uh, kind of relations with, with the UAE or with whoever. This was the position of the Palestinians. It was a very important uh, asset in their hands. All of a sudden, and they, by the way, the Palestinians were worried about losing this asset for, for a long time, while all kinds of pundits and diplomats and uh, experts, uh, self, self claimed experts, uh, said this is not going to happen. The Palestinians knew for a long time that this is a possibility. And they were very worried about the prob that, it is that it has a high probability of happening. And it's, it's been now for like four or five years that Abu Mazen is warning the, the Arabs again and again, don't do it, don't do it, I beg you, don't do it. Because he knew it was coming. And, uh, and uh, now that they lost it, they feel so weak to the extent that they even think about getting united, which is only if, uh, if the sky falls, they, they will unite themselves with, with Fatah and, the, and the Hamas but they show all kinds of uh, signs that uh, they are ready uh, to, to uh, unite because they are so worried about the terrible uh, development that happened. Yes, extension of sovereignty would have been an even worse uh, situation from the point of view of the Palestinians, it's true. But, uh, and this was avoided, but, uh, but still what happened is very bad. So it's not uh, the most terrible thing that can happen to them, but it's very bad. And, uh, and they are extremely worried and, and uh, frustrated. And, and the only thing they can, and there's, not, there's no way back. 
That's, that's the, the, the terrible thing about it. There's no way back. Even if uh, the United States changed its uh, position after elections, there's no way back on, on, that, uh, on that development. It's, it's there to stay. Because the, it's not that uh, the United Arab Emirates will say, oh, we made a mistake, we are going, coming back. This is not going to happen. Especially because, as I said, it's a warm peace, and it's also um, uh, our responsibility to show it's a good peace. And uh, so I, I don't think this is going to happen. And nobody, not, nor Egypt, nor Jordan, ever went back, even we, if, when we had uh, problematic relations with them, never, they never go back on such a strategic move. On the, on the contrary, it's going to gain momentum. That's what, it seems, to, that's what seems to happen, maybe even before the election. Uh, so uh, the Palestinians are extremely weakened and frustrated, as I said. And this is good news. This is good news. Because only if they realize that they, this is a, there's no way back and that they are weak, only then there is a chance, one in a million, but still better than nothing, that uh, the Palestinians will go to some sort of soul searching and ask themselves, how did we get to this point where even, when even my, our brother Arabs are leaving us behind? Now, all the Arabs are telling them why this is happening. Everybody tells them, listen, you are uh, rejectionist. You uh, stick to all kinds of uh, romantic dreams that are never going to come true. Your attitude towards Israel is totally wrong. Your attitude towards the use of terrorism is too wrong. You took our money and used it in order to pay salaries to terrorists. Uh, that's, uh, that's ridiculous. And, uh, and you ought to uh, uh, finance your uh, corruption. Uh, you have to change. Something has to happen to you. And uh, you have to change your cause. And you have to accept the fact that Israel is there to stay. And you have to make peace with Israel. And this is the nation state of the Jewish people. You have to accept it. That's, uh, that's the message of the Arabs. You have to listen to what's happening on, on Arab uh, channels. Uh, that, that is the message people are saying loudly and uh, very uh, courageously to the, to the Palestinians. And these are Arabs, not Israelis. And uh, the Palestinians listen. The Palestinians refuse to accept it, and definitely not before the election. Uh, but if they are going to have to uh, go through four more years of the same messages, uh, it, it's very difficult for them. And they, they, some of them may come to the conclusion that, well, maybe we didn't do the right thing until now. And only if they go through this process of soul searching, there is a chance that uh, the uh, peace will be possible. Because right now, peace cannot be, cannot be reached between us and the Palestinians, as long as the Palestinians stick to their narrative, denies that there is a Jewish people, that denies that the Jews have any historical connection to, to the land of Israel, that uh, uh, says that Jews are terrible creatures, uh, that feed all the, this uh, BDS and the uh, anti-Israel uh, uh, attitude of uh, the left in the, in the, in the West. It's, uh, these are the, the positions taken by the Palestinians today. Only if they change it, there's going to be a chance to make peace with them. And I hope uh, this move is going to, to have some positive impact. Finally, about, uh, about the uh, Americans in this, in this game. Uh, clearly, uh, it was a way for the Americans to avoid the potential repercussions of Israeli uh, extension of sovereignty over parts of Judea and Samaria and, uh, and the uh, Jordan Valley, as Israel was attempting to, to, to do uh, as, a, as, a par as part of the, uh, its readiness to accept the, the, the Trump the peace plan. The, uh, uh, but at the same time, the, for the Americans, this is something very important because it means that they can strengthen the pragmatic camp, which according to the current uh, administration is the camp that the Americans should support in order to face the real threat, which is Iran. For them, it's mainly Iran. For the, for the pragmatists, it's not only Iran, it's Turkey, not, not the less. Uh, but uh, for, for the Americans, it's Iran that has to be faced and uh, stopped. And this is a golden opportunity to strengthen it and to make it uh, more capable to face the threats it, uh, it uh, is challenged with. 
And one of the things that uh, they want to do in this context is they think that this is going to serve also as a, as a good context in which you can strengthen the pragmatist, the pragmatists not only by letting Israel into the camp, but also by uh, selling them all kinds of uh, military equipment that will make them more capable to, to uh, face the threats by themselves. And this, here comes the, the idea of uh, selling them the F-35s and things like that. Israel is not very happy about that because it says to itself, well, today we trust the leadership, but who knows what's going to, what's going to happen tomorrow. And uh, so, uh, and we saw that, uh, for example, with Turkey in the last minute, the United States itself had to cancel the, the, the deal to sell uh, F-35 to, to Turkey. But, uh, but uh, Israel has its point, the Americans have their point, they really are interested in strengthening uh, the Emiratis and others. The timetables don't necessarily fit because the problem with Iran is much more urgent than the time it's going to take until uh, the, Euro, the UAE will be able to protect itself by itself. Uh, but, uh, but in the longer run, this is still going to be some sort of a, project, of a problem, so you want to be prepared for that. And anyhow, the Americans are very happy because this, uh, in this context, first of all, they make peace. Uh, if, I, if I remember correctly from, we have both Jews and uh, Christians in the, in the White House today, but uh, uh, both of them are big believers in peacemaking and uh, even, uh, even according to Christianity, the peacemakers are blessed and will be the children of God. But, uh, but uh, beyond that, it, uh, it's a message to the Iranians. And we have to understand the, ma the major foreign policy issue on the, on the American uh, agenda right now is not necessarily China. China is, is going to be there for a long time. But it's what's going on with Iran. Now, I don't know if you followed the news, what, uh, what came out uh, during the last week of, uh, from Iran. But what the Iranians are doing is they are uh, enriching uranium in a, in a very fast pace. And uh, they've already uh, accumulated enough uh, low level enriched uranium for two, uh, we, we use the term uh, nuclear devices because these are not necessarily immediately a bomb, but they have they enriched enough uh, material for two nuclear devices. And they can have the first nuclear device if they decide to dash to, to a nuclear bomb. They, have to, they can have the first nuclear device within something like three, a little bit more than three months. Now, according to the JCPOA, the time that they were, were supposed to be kept away from having this was one year. Now it's, we are at, uh, at around three months. And fortunately, we are at three months and not less because the, um, the Iranians were planning to uh, install some advanced centrifuges in their nuclear facility in, at Natanz that would have uh, made it possible for them to have this uh, first uh, nuclear device, uh, sufficient quantity for a nuclear device uh, in, in less than two months. But something happened and they didn't install the, uh, the centrifuges. Nobody knows what exactly happened. Might be connected to some explosion there. And, uh, and uh, so they, they are three months away from having this first uh, sufficient quantity for a nuclear device. And within five months and a little bit, they will be able to have the second amount ready. And uh, this is all happening when the entire uh, international community, with the exception of the United States, allows Iran to go on with this business un unharmed. It's, it's really... I can understand why Russia and China are not in favor of the United States in this uh, confrontation. Not that I support their attitude, but I can explain to myself why, why this is so. I cannot explain to myself why is the United Kingdom standing side by side with Iran in confronting the United States and enabling the, the, the Iranians to get closer to having a sufficient quantity for a nuclear device. It's, uh, this, is, this is totally crazy. Now the Iranians today, uh, the, yesterday, have announced that they are going to build a new facility to assemble and produce uh, centrifuges, advanced centrifuges, in a mountain near Natanz, near this uh, facility that was uh, that exploded uh, on July 8th. 
and uh, in order to develop those and uh, assemble those centrifuges that will eventually be installed in the underground hall in, in this place, in, in Natan. That's, uh, they are totally committed to, to keep moving towards having a nuclear weapon. And, uh, and uh, when the United States did not manage to gain international support for the snapback of the sanctions over, over, uh, over Iran, this is something that makes the UAE, Israel, Saudi Arabia, many people in the Middle East that live in areas controlled by Iran, but hate Iran and want Iran to get off their lives, get out of their lives. Uh, all these people are very concerned with what's happening and the tensions are in the Middle East are growing. We have to understand it. I mean, you do, all of us are very busy with the corona and the thing like that, but you have to understand. The Iranian issue is, is on a very high temperature in, in the Middle East at, uh, at this point of time. So uh, this is a critical moment and the, the, this move of getting Israel and the UAE because of what's happening with uh, Iran closer is something uh, that is very important at this stage where we all prepare for all kinds of eventualities that can happen in the context of Iran. I think I'll stop. Yossi, I think, thank you. Yossi, there's terrific. There are a lot of questions, I think. Uh, Jackie, do you want to? Uh, um... well, thanks everyone for joining. It's so nice to have us. Sure. Uh, we'll start with a question from our international chair, Kevin Green. He would like to know where does Saudi Arabia stand in this mix? Well, first of all, uh, Saudi, th this would not have happened without the support of Saudi Arabia. It's, uh, the UAE is very close to Saudi Arabia. It's, uh, such a major strategic move would not be possible without uh, both uh, the UAE and the United States to some extent as well, uh, discussing this matter with the, with the Saudis. Now, uh, the, the big question is whether the Saudis are going to uh, uh, get out of their way and also do something similar and uh, establish normal relations with Israel. It's, uh, it's not their habit to do this kind of thing, but uh, they did it once when they were under um, unbelievable pressure after the 9-11 uh, attacks. So they came out with the Saudi peace plan that later became the, the Arab peace initiative. Uh, it's, uh, I, I believe that eventually it will happen. Eventually the Saudis will follow. But for the time being, as I said, the Saudis will prefer the half normalization option. And the, the first thing they did was allowing, uh, allowing uh, Israeli uh, El Al airplanes fly over uh, Saudi Arabia on their way to Abu Dhabi. Uh, this is, you may say, well, what a big deal. But it is a big deal. It is a big deal. And, uh, and when you listen to the messages coming from Saudi Arabia, I just listened yesterday to, uh, to a guy who was the head of a research institute in, in Saudi Arabia. He spoke about the, the state of Israel exactly the way I speak about the state of Israel. He was explaining why Israel is a, is a Jewish state and should be a Jewish state and what are the rights of the Jews in, in, yeah. in Israel the land of Israel and so on and so forth, it was amazing. And he was criticizing the Palestinians. He told the Palestinians, listen, why do you keep those uh, descendants of the refugees in, in the refugee camps? They're not coming back. What are you, what are you planning to do with these people? And, uh, and this was something that, uh, to hear that from uh, high, uh, highly uh, respected uh, Saudi research uh, fellow, it's, it's uh, really unbelievable. So it's, uh, and we have to remember, uh, Mohammed bin, bin Salman, who was the, who is the, 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 the uh, crown prince and the, the most important person in, in Saudi Arabia these days, he was interviewed by Jeffrey Goldberg in, in, in the Atlantic like three years ago. And, uh, and our, uh, Goldberg asked him, do you accept Israel's nation state of the Jewish people? And first of all, he didn't say no. He didn't say yes, but he was the closest to saying yes that I heard from any Arab leader ever. And, uh, and uh, I think he accepted, he just didn't say yes. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and this was really uh, very impressive in my mind. And it reflects what the Saudis think about what's going on. We were all, by the way, impressed when, when, the, uh, when MDC 
the Saudi uh, controlled uh, station in, in the uh, uh, TV station showed in, in the last Ramadan also the same messages. The same messages was on, on the TV. This, something big is happening in, the, in, in Saudi Arabia in this respect, and I believe eventually they will go all the way. For the, for the time being, they, they go halfway. Very encouraging. Karen Levy from Tampa uh, would like to ask, given our upcoming US presidential elections, <clears throat> how will different outcomes of the election affect what's happening in the Middle East now? Well, I'm not a fortune teller, so I, I, I cannot tell you how it's going to affect, but I can tell you what the, what the people in the Middle East believe is going to happen, okay? Let's, let's look at it from this perspective, what, what the people in the Middle East believe. So the ultra radicals in the Middle East, like ISIS and Al Qaeda, uh, and the ultra radicals within the uh, Iranian regime, they don't see much difference. For them, what they are worried about is the Western culture, and it doesn't matter who stands in the head of the Western culture. So they think that uh, since they have to fight against Western culture, it doesn't matter who's leading it. The, but the realistic re radicals, like Rouhani, like Zarif in, in Iran, those who are running the, the or identified with the agreement uh, on the Iran nuclear deal, like uh, Turkey, like uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in the, in the Sunni world, uh, they believe that uh, if Biden comes to, uh, to the White House, is elected to, to be the next president, their uh, good relations with the United States will uh, be reestablished. That's what they believe. They are very much waiting for uh, Biden to, to win the elections because they believe that it will first of all re, uh, re-enter, he will re-enter the, the Iran nuclear deal. And you have to understand there's nothing better in, in their life that happened to them than the Iran nuclear deal, which means that they don't have to cross any, any threshold on the way to having a wide arsenal of nuclear weapons. So if, they, uh, if the nuclear deal is back, they don't mind going back uh, to where they were uh, two years ago in order to make sure that in 15 years or in 10 years, they will have an, a, a big arsenal of nuclear weapons without any interruption on the way. It's, uh, and for Turkey, for the Muslim Brotherhood, they, they used to have very close relations with the former uh, administration. And uh, they believe that Biden, since he was a part of it, uh, will resume the, the relations as, as they were in the past. And uh, the fact that he spoke recently in, uh, in uh, some gatherings of Muslims in the United States in the con context of the election campaign uh, strengthened their belief that this is going to be the case if he is elected. Uh, that's, uh, that's their expectation. Whereas the pragmatists in the Middle East are very concerned. They believe that uh, the, the, big, the big difference between the former administration and the current administration was the attitude towards the pragmatists in the Middle East. Uh, Obama, uh, as president, said to Jeffrey Goldberg at the time, sorry that I mentioned him twice, uh, he, he told him that he thinks the Middle East should be shared between the pragmatists and the radicals. He thought that it's a good idea that half of the Middle East will be under radical uh, hegemony. It's, uh, the, the pragmatists, when they hear something like that, they, they, they run uh, crazy. And, uh, and they know that, uh, they realize that probably Biden is not as, uh, as much committed to that uh, attitude as was, uh, as was uh, President Obama at the time, but they are very worried that this is something that's going to happen. And this is, in my, my, in my mind, one of the reasons why the UAE went the way it went this time, at, at this uh, point of time, because they believe that this is, this is still early enough in order to get something from the Americans. Who knows if we are going to be able to get the same thing in the future? Maybe they, they deny that this was also in order to uh, help uh, Trump uh, show that he has uh, achievements in, in his foreign policy. So I don't know, maybe. But, uh, but this is the way the Middle Easterns look at the decision of uh, the next election in, in, the, in the United States. And if, whether they are right or wrong, as I said, I, I have no way to, to know. Uh, I just hope one thing, that uh, uh, the 
that Israel will be kept out of it and that Israel will become again a bipartisan issue with a commitment uh, to, towards it from both sides. Uh, it's uh, not so clear. We know that uh, the, the language of the uh, portfolio of the platform of the uh, Democratic Party was less uh, problematic than what we worried that it could have been. Uh, but still, we, we know that in the, in the Democratic Party there are uh, all kinds of uh, groups that are very anti-Israeli, uh, support BDS and so on, and on the extreme left of the uh, progressive part of the, of the party. And uh, that is something that, uh, that we are worried about. But, uh, but we shall have to wait and see and hope that both parties will eventually be as committed to Israel's security and to Israel's well-being uh, because the, we don't have a better friend than the United States regardless of what are the results. Thank you. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Is there any is there any consensus or what's the feeling on the ground in Israel about the um, the two candidates for president this fall and how do you, how do people feel it will impact Israel's prospects for peace and the future? So it, uh, we have different opinions here. It's not uh, it's not one opinion, but basically I would say most Israelis are very happy with President Trump with what everything he did for Israel. And uh, he has such a long list of uh, moves that he did for Israel that is really, all of them are unprecedented. Uh, by recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, uh, moving the embassy, recognizing uh, the Golan Heights as part of, uh, of Israel, uh, saying the, 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 the obvious that uh, uh, Israeli uh, communities in, the, in Judea and Samaria are not illegal, not, are not per se illegal or illegitimate. It's uh, understanding that the, the, the peace plan he brought was the first peace plan that is, is, is a peace plan that can, that can be implemented. And it's not putting Israel in, in, in a terrible threat and uh, a terrible danger. Uh, so, uh, uh, and he brought peace with, uh, and enabled us to have peace with, uh, with the UAE. And he strengthened the, the, the pragmatists that we are so committed to their uh, success in facing the, the, uh, the radicals. So however, from whatever uh, direction you look at it, we are very thankful to, uh, to President Trump. And uh, we want to believe that uh, if he is going to elect, that we shall have four more years of more of the same. And uh, maybe we shall, we shall be able to eventually implement the plan because if he is elected, then as I said before, the Palestinians, will have to really look at the option of uh, uh, some soul searching and changing their attitude. I mean, he, one, amongst other things that he did, he closed their uh, uh, office in, in Washington and the, uh, supported the idea that they should not be paid with uh, American uh, taxpayers' uh, money uh, as long as they use this money in order to pay salaries to terrorists to kill Israelis and Americans. It was the Taylor Force Act. And uh, I'm very proud of being the person who wrote the, the, the paper that led to this act. And I think that uh, this was very important. And, uh, and uh, so all these things are things that we all uh, appreciate and, and uh, know that uh, they are important. That said, uh, we, we consider Biden also as a friend of Israel. And uh, he has a different approach maybe but, uh, but we still regard him as a friend of Israel. And, uh, and if he's elected, we'll see what, what he can do for Israel. Uh, and, uh, it's, uh, as I said, we, we be prefer, I prefer, that uh, the Israeli uh, point will not be a disputed uh, idea between the, the parties, even though the feeling is that it is. And look, Israelis did not forget Israelis did not forget the two elements in which the Obama administration intentionally, knowingly threw us under the bus, both on resolution 2334 of the United Nations Security Council, which was really uh, stabbing us in the back in the last days after he was already laying back, and, uh, and the uh, agreement with Iran, which, uh, uh, about which he himself said, 
I, I can understand, he said, those who uh, support Israel who are unhappy with the, with the agreement, with the deal. So I mean, what are you trying to say? It's, uh, these two steps were uh, not well accepted in Israel, as you can imagine. I just wanted to add one point here, and, and, and that is a, a, a point of Arab and Islam, uh, an Arab Muslim world context. If you take Israel out of this equation for a minute, the major motivating factor for normalization um, with the Sunni Arab establishment today is a collective fear about an Iranian regime subversion of the entire Middle East and existential threat to each one of the Arab countries. And these Arab countries are now looking to Israel as, you know, in a sense, their security protector, as opposed to looking to Israel as the provocateur and the problem of the Middle East. So in this sense, we've seen a 180 degree shift. But, but if you take Israel out, the major issue here is the Arab world's rejection of the JCPOA. And it sometimes isn't said publicly for reasons that we know, but the Arab world has made it very clear. I'm talking about most of the members of the Arab League that the JCPOA, from their point of view, poses strategic and even existential dangers to them. And that's why you'll start seeing uh, perhaps more countries other than the UAE stepping up, as Cooper said, uh, and, and publicly embracing Israel, which whom they see today as their security guarantor. Thank you, Dan. So we can, you wanna just, uh, move to the, um, the possibilities for tennis diplomacy, Jackie, now that we have sure. sort of new reality. I mean, one of the things that we wanted to mention to segue into is that this, this particular normalization um, relationship with the UAE also uh, has a great precedent with the Israel Tennis Centers in terms of what, what the extraordinary uh, development that happened in 2014 with a South African uh, tennis team from Soweto as we all remember, which as Soweto was, as, as we all remember back in the 1960s and 70s, was the, you know, the, was the crown jewel, if you will, of the, uh, of the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. And we've always felt that it, many people on this call and, and myself included, um, that tennis is a wonderful diplomatic tool. It crosses religions, it crosses cultures, it crosses ethnicities, it even, it even bridges conflicts. Um, and here, uh, you know, we had a wonderful South African team come that was unable to, to, to play in years before because of apartheid, before 94, and they came to Israel and had an extraordinary time six years ago. And we're seeing that with these new developments with the UAE, we, may very, we, we were going to reach out and, and um, with our children and, and, and to the children of the UAE and embrace them uh, and, and try to develop relationships with tennis and mutual training. Uh, uh, and mutual youth development uh, through the, the tennis center. So that's where our, our eyes are. And I think that you have a little video to show what, what, what happened with the South Africans, uh, Jackie? Yes, we do. Uh, to take a look at the, the, the possibilities of, of tennis as a diplomatic uh, enhancer and a diplomatic game changer is, is no less important than what we've seen here in terms of security. Ready, Dan? Sure. Here we go. Finally this week, many world leaders and the media often accuse Israel of being an apartheid state because of its policies towards Palestinians. Now the Jewish state is reaching out to South Africans who lived under that racial segregation for almost 50 years. Julie Stahl has that story. When South African tennis coach Moses Ntuping brought four of his young tennis players to Israel, it was something he had waited for all his life. This is a dream come true for me. As a teenager, Natuping developed into a star tennis player, but could never travel or play on national teams. Unfortunately, during those apartheid years, we have not been given opportunity to experience what I'm experiencing now at this age, at my age. Ronen Morali of the Israel Tennis Center invited the group to visit. He said the idea came from the Israeli ambassador who wanted to introduce the South Africans to the real Israel. Sport, you know, it's like a bridge over, you know, over cultures, over, you know, to bring, you know, people together and, and to see that Israelis are, you know, are normal people, you know, without horns in their head and, uh, and I think it was, it did the job. Nertuping said he saw nothing that resembled the racial segregation of apartheid. 
So far, I haven't seen anything uh, that I can criticize about Israel. All I could see is people, jolly people, friendly people, all the way, willing to help wherever possible. And it touched the youngsters as well. I knew about uh, Israel fighting, there's a war, but I thought where I'm going, there will, uh, there will be a peace place and no war there. They're so kind to us. I see they're, so, they're treating us like families. I think it's an incredible country that has incredible people, kind people, that must appre like appreciate people from Africa or, or Northern America or South America, the whole world. The Israel Tennis Center started nearly 40 years ago. Now they have 14 centers around the country, like this one in Jerusalem, serving 20,000 children a week from different backgrounds. The Israel Tennis Center is a blend of everything. You know, like you have Arab kids, you have Ethiopian kids, you have everything, you know, a blend of everything. You know, you have Christians, you know, you have Arab Christians. You have, I mean, it's like a blend of everything. This is what, you know, why, why this project is so beautiful. Like Mohammed, who is Muslim, and his Jewish friend, Omer. Both want to eventually turn professional and say their friendship is the best part of the tennis center. That positive atmosphere helps when new players visit. The first time I play with the uh, kids from South Africa and uh, I like to play with them. I didn't realize that I will play with them. It's just so unreal, I think. This first exchange proved successful and those at the Israel Tennis Center hope for many more opportunities in the future. Julie Stahl, CBN News, the Israel Tennis Center, Jerusalem. Thanks, Jackie, that's great. So Dan, we wanna go forward and uh, create the same kind of children's to children's diplomacy with the UAE, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely, and it, it doesn't get any better. And uh, that's where I think that we, I think we're all looking. I think is the uh, era is uh, I think our CEO is on the call, and uh, I know that uh, he's expressed interest in reaching out. And I think we can find through uh, Andy uh, and some of our championship tennis players uh, relationships with our uh, new partners in the UAE. Thank you. It was an incredible program. Very exciting, and we look forward to the future has a lot of opportunity. Absolutely, and I wanna thank uh, General Cooperwasser for a really extraordinary briefing uh, uh, and, um, and all of you uh, for joining. We, we've always wanted to make the Israel Tennis Center not just about tennis for sure, but also a window into Israeli society. So these uh, lunching, lunching with Israel hopefully will, will continue uh, on a regular basis. And thank you so much, Jackie and Wendy for making all this happen and uh, and all of you this whole our whole family here for joining in uh certainly once every few weeks thank you dan and thank you general brigadier general cooper Wasser. wendy you want to close us today please sure. so um thank you uh yossi and dan so we've received so many beautiful emails from you about our lunch and learn series indicating how vital itech services are to the children at risk in israel we would greatly appreciate your urgent support of ITEX Children's Emergency Relief Fund to save one or more children from social isolation, anxiety, and depression during the pandemic. Your support will provide tablets so children in need can access ITEX online mental health sessions, return to ITEX for tennis, fitness, and socialization, and play like normal children. So we really thank you for your support. We wanna wish you a Shana Tova, a sweet new year with continued health and prosperity. And, and save the date for our next Lunch and Learn, October 14th. And um, save the date for our iTech virtual gala on November 18th. This will not be the last time you will hear about it. It's gonna be a fantastic evening with a taste of Israel and a concert with David Broza. Um, so we will uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Bye. Bye.